Brought to you by JMR Rentals, professional digital cinema and broadcast equipment rentals in Brooklyn, New York. JMRNY.com. And now get 15% off your first rental when you use the promo code WEEKEND. Call 347-721-3400 or email info at jmrny.com for details. Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and joining me via Zoom today, he is an accomplished writer-director and the co-founder of Colon Up Productions, Mr. Onyi Ude. Welcome, Onyi. How's it going, Jason? Happy to be here. It's good to see (laughs) all the way from from the left coast. Yes. Um, We've gotten a lot of L.A. folk uh, on the show, so it's it's good that... uh, Zoom exists. I want to get into it and talk to you about uh, Colonut and different productions you guys done, but I want to talk to you about you first. So how did you get started in animation? Like, what's your origin story? I'm a, I'm a kid of the 90s. Uh, so <laughs> uh, afternoon cartoons, Saturday morning cartoons, it was just like, that was my great escape um, and my great joy. So uh, it was something that even when I was growing up, um, I just continued with, right? Um, animation continued to evolve with me as I got older because, um, you know, Toonami was was kind of <laughs> bringing that intersection of animation and, uh, uh, and animation into the mainstream. So things like that just helped me keep this passion and love. Um, eventually, when I was working for Apple, um, I had a great opportunity and I had a, an idea to really tell stories through the African lens because... Uh, as someone who's Nigerian, uh, you know what I mean? I I saw this great opportunity to tell these amazing stories that I grew up on, uh, but the world really hadn't seen. So I called my brother, who at the time was doing his master's in China, uh, so to speak. Um, and I was like, hey, let's, let's just do this. Um, and then it was he and I started writing. One page became 500. Uh, two people became 25. And 10 years later, um, we developed over 100 IPs internally, um, and now we're in development with some some folks and, you know, doing some exciting things. Tell me kind of about Colina and what you guys do, like what's your bread and butter, so to speak. We focus primarily on doing our own work. Um, not every now and again, we'll consult on short films or projects like that, um, but uh, we're really focused on our mission, which is telling stories through the African lens, right? Really focused on just getting these amazing stories from all over the continent and and telling them in a very unique way um, because we, we see that uh, these stories are underrepresented in the industry and we know the tremendous value that they have so instead of complaining about it I'm always like let's just do something about it so so can you give me uh, an example of some of the work that you've done yeah like some uh, of the, some of the stuff that you ha- have out or stuff stuff that you produce definitely definitely so um, when we started this, like had no animation background, no knowledge, no nothing. Um, <laughs> but why would that, why should that stop you, right? Uh, the internet exists. So if you want to learn something bad enough, you kind of go out there. So we started, our first IP was Red Origins. Um, we, we ended up doing a Kickstarter originally for it um, back in the day and um, it didn't succeed, but it caught the attention of those, some couple folks in the industry um, and they said, hey, let's, can we hop on board and just kind of help you all like kind of move this forward? Because it's a really interesting story. So we came back, we, re- we revised, we uh, kind of upgraded the story. And then we posted another Kickstarter and then it was successful. It's like, okay, this is great, like great traction. Uh, and it was a matter of us now learning the industry as we're in it. Um, so we ended up putting comics out for it. We did... Um, maybe three comics for, for Red Origins. And we also put it on Webtoon. And we did a couple other shorts here and there. And while we're doing that, um, we had some offers to s- simply just sell the show. Um, but we, we didn't feel comfortable just selling it and not having certain rights to it. So we decided that we'd go the path less uh, travel and we would build up our studio and its IP to the point where we can come in as a joint venture um, and retain some ownership and, and real control over that story to make sure it's being told the right way. So 
um, in that process, we continue to develop. Um, Kisi the Electron Girl came out of that, which is another great story. We did an animation for that. We did a comic for that. Um, Seven Galaxies, Neptune's Blues, and you know we just keep releasing them now every year. Um, and the, the formula is pitch Bible comic, no pitch Bible comic animation, and then we then we go and pitch on the back end, right? And then we just keep rolling it like that. That way we're constantly developing, we're constantly keeping our mind sharp um, and letting people know what we got out there. And now we're developing we're developing some feature films on the back end now as well. Tell me a little bit, because I saw some of the um, Red Origin stuff on YouTube and I saw some of Kesey on your website. Can you just kind of talk about those? Like, what are they about? And kind of sure. like give like a little, like give me like a little Hollywood log line little, little, kind little, of little thing. little Hollywood log line. Okay, so... Um, Red Origins is about um, these three friends who magically get transported to Neo-Africa. So I got to pause there and really just talk about Neo-Africa. Neo-Africa is this amazing futuristic idea of what Africa is after what we call the second African Renaissance, right? So if you're a history buff, you're aware of what the first African Renaissance is, so to speak, um, which was this pan-African push away from colonialism. Um, so we create in our, in our universe the second African Renaissance that pushes the neo-African universe forward. So all of our stories essentially take place uh, during or further into the neo-African universe. So um, Red Origins is these three kids, they magically get transported to neo-Africa and upon entry they break what's called a bronze taboo. And now in order to get back home they must serve as a part of this peacekeeping secret society where um, African magic and uh, all these creatures of folklore exist, right? So they find themselves in the midst of this craziness. Um, and that's really where the story starts and, and really starts to go from. Um, it's a real fun story. It's, I, it's the first story where we really dive into African magic and the magical systems. Um, and also African folklore. We, we take these creatures of African folklore from Mazian Bay, the tortoise, uh, which in the, I think in the States, he's more known as the turtle that beat the hare. But we actually kind of go deeper into that lore so people understand who he is. Um, Anansi the spider, who's well known, and then all these other trickster gods in the African pantheon. So we kind of really dive deep into that through Red Origins. So that's Red Origins. Um, we're coming out with some really cool stuff with regards to that. <clears throat> Then we have Kisi the Electron Girl. Kisi the Electron Girl is about a little girl who has an affinity for technology. She loves it, right? Super savant, she loves it. Uh, and she lives near an e-waste site. And one day on her path to picking up spare parts to build stuff at an e-waste site, she finds an experimental chip that accidentally fuses with her biology. Now she has this amazing power to command all technology. Um, so it's just a really fun, exciting um, uh, animation and, and comic. And it's we really just dive into what it's like for someone to just live in a wonderland of technology when you have that love for technology. And um, it's it just keeps going. Like you go into cyberspace, you know what I mean? We, we talk about ancient laboratories uh, on the continent. And then we also kind of talk about, highlight the e-waste uh, issue, right? A lot of people don't know one of the biggest e-waste sites in the world is in Ghana, right? So we, we talk about this amazing thing that's happening where kids, even though it's dangerous, go into this e-waste site, grab broken materials that are toxic and build amazing things, um, which is what inspired me to write this story. Did you ever have, um, like when you're pitching this stuff, did you ever have any resistance thinking, you know, America's not going to get this. We don't know how to market this. We don't know how big a market there is for this. Did, did you did you have any of that resistance? Not resistance in that sense, but a lot of times when you don't understand certain vantage points or viewpoints, you try to readjust the lens so it fits your reality, right? So what we had a lot of was, um, and it, you know, it's not to their fault because this is what they know. You had, we had a lot of executives like, oh, that's great, but what if we did this? And it's like, I, I see where you're going with this, but there's an actual reason why we have to tell it in this way, right? There's, there's value in telling it through this particular African lens because one, 
it's more true to the story. And then two, um, it gives people more insight into the day-to-day -day lives of people on that side, right? Um, so in the beginning, that was a little bit of friction in getting on the same page, right? Um, but eventually we're able to meet some, some people who, who just understood it. Um, and, you know, we, we got some green lights. Now our first green light um, was with, first green light was with Cartoon Network, but they had the whole org change where um, everyone was pushed under uh, uh, AT&T. And, you know, if, if you have experience in the industry, once there's a big org change like or change like that, just know anything in development is pushed out. So my project and a bunch of others got like basically pushed. Um, but you, you learn not to take it personally. It's just how it goes. Um, and then you just keep pitching, you go to the next person. So um, that's pretty much what happened. I've talked to quite a few people about pitches and about pitching and about you know, trying to get something into a network and everybody's kind of got a different way in. They've got a, like a different story. Uh, the one thing that um, Aaron spoke about and a couple of other people have spoken about that I've talked to is the kind of um, animation explosion that's happened recently. Did you guys see any of the fallout for that? Or did you get like, w was like, okay, we've got this much work, but then since 2020 we have, you know, it, it's kind of boomed up or have, because you do your own thing, has it sort of made the same, maintain the same? Definitely, it definitely affected us that we were getting way more meetings than, <laughs> than normal, right? Um, and, and just to kind of point out and give more insight into what the animation explosion is, right? Everyone's familiar with the streaming wars, right? 10 years ago, how many streaming services were there? Maybe one. And now there's more than I can count. All of them have to fill up their catalogs and build up these amazing 600 hours plus of animation content in that, right? Um, overall, more people are watching television or watching media now more than ever. So I believe from 2019 to 2020, there's been a 16.5% increase in spending on content. So I believe in 2020, $220 billion was spent on um, creating content, right? And of that also is animation. So across the board, you're just seeing this 4X, 5X explosion happening. So now that everyone's trying to battle to get this market space, the cre it's a creator's market. So now they, they want to hear everything, like, just bring it, come, like, get it over here. So granted, there are those, um, <clears throat> There are those properties that are going to get reboots because it's a safer bet, so to speak, but there's not enough reboots that you can do. People want new stuff. So the likes of Amazon, the likes of Disney, Netflix in a big way are really spending more money on developing content, right? Um, and acquiring content. So on the creator side, if you've ever had any connection to the industry, you're getting a phone call right now asking, what do you have? Because people are trying to win the streaming war. Um, more than people know. And it's, it's even affecting how animation is being done because now you have budgets being allocated to actually go into developing emerging markets. So now you have, oh, we're creating the head of Africa content. So now that person's job is to go to the local markets in different places in Africa, find the talent, groom the talent and get them ready for production. Same things happening in Latin America, same things happening in Europe, same things happening in, um, in Southeast Asia. So that this is what that explosion looks like. And that's, what, that's what's happening all across the board. And um, the, pre the prediction is that the overall global um, animation market, right now it's 200, in 2020, it was 270 billion. They believe by 2030, it'll be 697 or 95 billion. So it's, they're, they're anticipating it's gonna keep going. Um, and I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more because people are consuming more. You know, uh, television has changed completely. The metrics have changed completely. Um, now, because you can have it your way, shout out to BK, uh, <laughs> because you can have it your way, you're watching more, right? Old way of watch television, your show comes on, great, you watch, you enjoy it. Something else comes on, you leave. But now, what happens? Are you still watching? Yes, I'm still watching. Click. You keep going, you keep consuming. So, markets trying to meet that demand. I know that a lot of major studios like Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers has a huge animation department. They have directors, they have voice actors here. 
Uh, they have voice directors here and they have people like board out everything and then they send it to Asia to actually do the animation. Do you guys like do the same as similar process or like wh how does that work from the, the time you get an idea, script it and then board it out and can you kind of just go into that a little bit? So I, I like to refer to my studio as like an, uh, a new age studio, right? Um, it's always been 100% digital. My team is, I have some folks in Denmark, Spain, um, Nigeria, um, Florida, like a couple people in China, like we're everywhere. Um, <laughs> and that's just the very nature of our team. So because my team is like that, we can afford to just quickly pass things around our, 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 our ecosystem, right? We have our own internal pipeline um, where people are, are, are essentially cogs in the, in the wheel and it goes down this conveyor belt um, of production. So it starts normally with myself and my, my brother. We pitch to each other, we come up with these ideas, we pick the best three, write all the synopsis, write all the uh, character information, then it goes to the writers, the writers embellish, do all that stuff. As the writers are embellishing, the character designers are doing the character design and working with myself and my brother, um, or rather working with myself, at, while, whereas my brother's working with the writers, getting that all situated. And then um, our concept artist, visual artist, is working on the color theory, because um, all of our animation has this kind of color pattern, co color theory and color uh, palette that we work off of. Um, and then it goes down the line, just keeps going down the line. So. Um, Ours is very unique in that sense that where we don't have to essentially give it to another studio. It, it can all happen internally. Uh, but for the most part, and here's where phrasing is important, right? Studios like mine are typically called boutique. I, I refer to them as boutique studios, right? You do all the pre-production work. So that means you're doing character design, concept, coloring, script, storyboards, animatics, and then you stop there right that's kind of like the most you can do for a large-scale production so if you're doing like an entire television show that's where you export if you're doing a feature film that's where you export if, you know even maybe a, a a larger than life commercial so to speak that's where you export whereas um, if you're a vendor studio you're doing the the, the bigger legwork you're doing the the production piece of a television show you're doing the production piece of animation, animated film, commercial, whatever the case may be. Uh, and that's what has kind of made animation more global, so to speak, in my opinion, right? Because that legwork is so intense that here in the States, it's not cost, it's, the casino is not cost effective, right? So they, they're shipping out, they're getting it out there, like send it out. But what's happening now, to your point, they don't have enough connections to studios, which is why the backlog is happening. Rather, they're taking more projects, yes. They're greenlighting more projects. But now the question is, hey, we want to greenlight you, but do you have connections to a vendor studio? Like, who are you partnered with? That's now a part of the question if you get picked up. Um, because the truth of the matter is the studios no longer have the capacity or the reach or the directory to be connect to connect these productions with vendor studios. So this is that next new frontier, so to speak. Um, this is what this is the new jobs that are being created in this uh, golden era and this explosion of animation. You're going to see more VFX. Um, cloud-based platform that allow people to work on production anywhere in the world. Um, and then you're gonna see more talent-based um, directories or um, talent um, projects or platforms that connect studios together. And then some other things, right? So yeah, that's what's pretty much what's happening. For you guys too, because you're in this unique position and you have your own IP, you're kind of ahead of the game because a lot, of, I think a lot of people now are scrambling to like build an animation division for their studio, or try to you know even find people who can take properties that maybe were live action and turn them into animation. Um, and you know it takes a long time. Uh, but what I was kind of curious about is um, because I think a lot of the people who listen to the show are people who are kind of 
either new to the industry or trying to break into the industry or trying to kind of get to the next level in their career. If you knew somebody coming into the animated world today or like wanted to get into it, do you have any advice that you would give them? The advice that I would give them is even though this is a creative endeavor, uh, there's also systems in place, right? You have to be disciplined in your approach. Um, it can't just be, oh, I create ideas when I, when I feel like it. No, get into the practice of every three months, I must come up with three new ideas and maybe those three ideas will live in this specific genre. I will come up with three shows that fit um, um, animation for children and it's a bridge show. So it's for ages four to eight. So I'm doing research on what a bridge show looks like. I'm doing rich research on what a successful bridge show looks like. And then I'm reading or I'm experiencing things that are helping me be creative. And I'm forcing myself to work this creative muscle on a, on a deadline right? <laughs> I'm forcing myself to work this creative. And then once I get the idea, it's not just, okay, I have the idea. No. It's, all right. Here's my synopsis. Here's my log line. Here's the, you know, the, the story bio. Here's this, here are the characters, like actually take it seriously, right? You don't just stop at the idea. And for those who want to get into this, you have to understand um, if you treat it like a hobby, that's what it'll, it'll remain a hobby. But if you treat it like a job, like you act like you're getting paid for this, even though there's no money coming in yet, you will get those opportunities sooner than later. But um, operationalizing the process is just extremely important. And that's the advice um, after about 10 years of doing this that I've learned. You must operationalize your process. So you guys develop ideas internally and you're always like you said, you and your brother kind of pitch to each other. Yeah. And we have a similar thing in my company. It's like, we, it's not really an idea until somebody else says yes. And, mm -hmm. you know, me and my writing partner bounce stuff back and forth. But I found that the hardest work, it's not really coming up with the idea or writing the script. It's all the other stuff. It's all that other development stuff. It's like world building and series Bibles and pitch sheets and pitch decks. And, you know, uh, it's like, it's hard enough just to come up with a good idea. But that's like where the, that's kind of the, the separation point. That's kind of like the amateur from the professional, like you were saying, where the professional knows that, you know, these things take money. And if I want to get money, I've got to be able to put this work in. I think maybe the hardest decision then becomes like, well, how do you decide, you know, what's what ideas are worth? Because I assume that you don't do that for every idea you get, you know, like, you know, like, are there like a specific set of criteria that you're like, well, if it's got these three things then it's a real idea and we're going to put forth the Bible and do all that stuff? Or is it just kind of like, you know, we're going to do it for everything and see what works kind of thing? Every single idea that goes through the pipeline has to be, has to go through like the, the, the hellfire and trial of the pitch. Like I have three, my partner will have three and we will pitch it to each other. And you can, you can, in that pitch process, you can kind of hear what projects have legs or projects are, oh, that's a little harder to sell. Right. And if you're passionate about it, you're going to pitch a little harder and it's going to go back and forth. And then in going back and forth then and really trying to find what the 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 uh, the heart of the story is in that pitch. That's where we end up working on uh, coming up with some of our best IP. For example, Kishi the Electron Girl. My partner hated it. <laughs> he hated it. He's like, no, I absolutely no. And I was like, no, this is and I had I had after actually have to now justify why we're going to spend time and money and resources on this IP. And I'm, I'm, I'm referencing the things, I'm showing where this can go. I'm, I'm saying these age groups, I'm, I'm pulling references, um, articles, numbers. I'm really selling it to him in preparation to now sell it to the network. So by the time I'm going to the network, I've already gone through my internal, <laughs> you know, my internal uh, uh, hellfire, so to speak. So I'm a lot more polished when I'm in front of them and I can speak to, hey, this is why this show is a good fit for you. And, you know, it's, it's a lot more polished, but um, that's our process every single time. There's no exception. Um, yeah. And that's kind of helped maintain the quality of a lot of our IPs. I, I appreciate you saying that because I think it's a, a lot of the stuff that people don't talk about. It's like, oh, I wrote a script and then we sold it. But, you know, there's like a million steps in between million. having the idea of writing a script and then actually selling it. 
Um, anyway, this has been great, but I'm going to wrap up. For those who uh, want to get to know you or maybe hire you or like buy a property of yours or something, <laughs> where can they find you on the web? Oh, okay, so um, I run the animation club on Clubhouse, 19,000 animators uh, plus. Uh, we meet every Monday. Uh, so you can come check me out. Come talk to me there. Um, I'm also on Twitter at CEO, the letter N, chairman on Twitter. I'm always on there talking. Um, same thing with uh, Instagram. And you can also email. You can email us at colnutproductions at gmail.com. And uh, we will get back to you. Um, I consult for companies. I consult for animation companies quite a bit, actually. Um, and a, a lot of the big names that you're familiar with. So. Yeah, I'm available. Let's talk. I'm also coming out with something for animators, a great platform called Pipeline. We'll be dropping this fall. And just like we're talking in this conversation, the whole point of Pipeline is connecting talent with content creators. So if you have an idea, we essentially pair you with a boutique studio or a vendor studio to bring your dream to reality. So it'll be coming out this fall, Pipeline. Thank you all out there for taking this trip down the rabbit hole for more of our content, including our movie reviews. Visit our website, norestfortheweekendpodcast.com. Don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Once again, I want to thank my guest, Onye Yude, and our sponsor, JMR Rentals. For Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. 